language of symbol and story. Now, hold that thought. By the time the Jews were wandering about in the desert and beginning to solidify their relationship with God, the dual nature of kingship manifested itself in the practice of using the scapegoat instead of a person. The Jews were from very early on in their history monotheistic, but they were still part of the culture in which they lived. So for the Jews, there were two goats. One goat had the sins of the people ceremoniously placed upon its head, and it was sent off into the, district, the desert, symbolically carrying the sins of the people away from the encampments. The other goat, the perfect goat, was sacrificed, and its blood covered the people for the next year. It didn't remove their sins, but it covered them over, so that they could continue in indirect fellowship with God, without themselves being completely destroyed. The custom of the king figure at being at once the hero and the goat is still found in many African tribal rituals today. I don't think it's common practice to sacrifice the king at the end of a given length of time, but vestiges of this ritual are still found. And we, in our society, bow down and swear allegiance to many different kinds of kings. Still, even our king is expected, in theory anyway, to bear the sins of the people, and to be willing to sacrifice himself for them. Unfortunately, it rarely works out that way. Lord Acton said, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are always bad men, the demon and the deity. God tells us again and again, God is the only one who can receive worship and glory and not be destroyed by it. Human beings are simply not designed to, do, to be anything but creatures, and we are created beings, created with a need for relationship, and created with a need to worship. <coughs> Many of us resist worshiping God for a number of reasons, but worship we do, and we still like our objects of worship to be both the hero and the goat. In our Old Testament reading of today, Jeremiah is addressing the kings of Israel. I don't know about you, but I would not want to hear God saying to me, You have not dealt properly with my sheep, and now I will deal with you. God indicts these kings who were entrusted with the care of his flock. Remember, a king like all the neighbors had was not God's idea. God wanted to be their king, but the people wanted human kings, and human kings they got. In this passage, we get a glimpse into the future, a glimpse into the time when God himself will once again be truly our king. The righteous branch will be raised up. This king will be a true shepherd and will deal wisely and he will execute justice and righteousness in the land. So what does justice and righteousness look like under God's definition? Remember that one of our themes for this Sunday is judgment. And here in our Old Testament passage, we hear language that God's king will execute justice. Justice, judgment. Hold that thought. Now you have Two thoughts. God myths that express something deep and universal, and God's king will execute judgment. <clears throat> this passage from Jeremiah is included in any list of prophecies regarding the coming Messiah. So God is pointing to Jesus when he describes the king who will be a true shepherd, who will deal wisely and execute justice and righteousness in the land. Okay. So, who was Jesus, really? I love our Colossians passage because it so poetically tries to put into words the identity of Jesus Christ. We have to understand the controversy about the nature of Christ isn't something that was new. The arguments, the false teachings, the heresies began immediately. 
there was a very famous one that came to a head in 321 AD with the Council of Nicaea. This was the Arian heresy. An Alexandrian priest named Arius preached that, God, that Jesus Christ was not God, did not pre-exist creation, that he was himself a created human being whose job it was, was to sacrifice himself for the people. This has some scriptural support, but the Council of Nicaea considered all of it, and they decided that the stronger argument is that Jesus Christ is, was, always has been God himself. Sometimes when we are talking about the nature of God, the nature of Jesus Christ, and the nature of the Trinity, I feel like I do when, uh, when theoretical mathematicians talk about five and six and seven or ten dimensions. Maybe they can work mentally in five or six or ten dimensions and actually imagine them, but I cannot. So it is with trying to use words to describe the relationship within the Trinity. Three beings, one God. Is Jesus literally the Son of God, like Andrew is Vic's son? Or is this symbolic language trying to reduce something of far more than six dimensions into the limited dimension of words? Jesus is called the Son of God, the Son of Man, the firstborn. Here in this passage, Jesus is referred to as the firstborn of all creation. So did the creation give birth to Jesus, or did Jesus, as the passage later indicates, predate creation? The key thought here is that God is relational. God is love. So within himself, God must demonstrate all the elements of love. And yet throughout the Old and New Testament, the monotheistic nature of God resonates. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The most important idea for us to focus on here is the idea of image. And the other key is found in the concept of sonship, as it was meant in Jesus' day and before. It's all tied up in inheritance and in the idea of being an agent. When a man inherited his father's estate, he became, in essence, his father. When a person is an agent for a landowner, people who were dealing with the agent we're actually dealing with the owner. And Jesus, as the image of the invisible God, in whom the fullness of God was here present, is being described as being fully God and fully human. It's not a literal father-son relationship, but rather as the Son is the expression of the Father and the image of the Father, so the Son images the Father in carrying the Father's life forward into the future. He images the Father in his dealings with others and with the estate. Jesus is the human face.